Chapter 17. Oh, what a child I still was. A petulant and stubborn and willful child who was so filled up with my newfound learning and my simpleton ideas of liberty that I thought all I had to do was read a few books and rub shoulders with people of great ideas and the world would change for me. That people would see me coming and step aside and say, look out, here comes Rachel Marsh. She reads books. She's found that she's not afraid to speak out. She's decided what she's about. And she thinks the promise of this liberty that some have already died for here in Boston means that she can go about and do anything she wants, regardless of who gets hurt. I had so much to learn, not from books. It wasn't the kind of thing you could learn from books. It was about people. And it had to do with understanding that they could be miserable misery of spirit and heart. I want to spite you just for the sport of it, and that people could be blessed with every great gift the Lord has to give, or plagued with every misery, like Job, and they could never rise above what they were, but just go on, stuck like that being people. Oh, they might have moments of brilliance or goodness, like John Adams or Henry Knox, but when push came to shove, why, they were just afflicted souls worrying the small matters to the bone above the big ones made me sore of heart just to think on it. Mrs. Adams's new baby arrived on the 29th of May. It was a healthy baby boy. They named him Charles. Mrs. Adams was completely taken with him and everyone was glad the birth had gone well. Within the week, Sam Adams came to the house with a bottle of Madeira in hand and clapped Mr. Adams on the back and congratulated him for winning the election. John Adams said, what election? I haven't run for anything. I was sent to fetch glasses then, and I brought them into the parlor on a silver tray. Why, Sam said, the citizens of Boston met at Fanuel Hall and have elected you to represent Boston in the House of Representatives and the General Court. John Adams seemed stunned. The people hate me, he said, for defending the British soldiers. The people love you, cousin, said Sam. You beat Mr. Ruddock 536 votes to 418. They went up the stairs with the Madeira and glasses to tell Abigail the good news. She had not yet come below stairs after the birth of her baby. So John Adams had to travel to Cambridge then, where the legislator met because acting Governor Hutchinson had exhaled it from Boston a while back. Mr. Adams was away a lot, and the trip took time because the ferries were, going, were slow going. Then, when the legislator had its summer recess, he decided to ride circuit again. He was taking cases in Falmouth, Newbury, Portsmouth, Salem, everywhere. To make money, I overheard him tell his wife. The job as representative had no pay, and he had to earn money to keep them until Christmas. Summer came, with its cool mornings and hot days, its street noises filtering in open windows, its bay breezes smelling of the sea and billowing the curtains, its long evenings and its dreamy haze. With Mrs. Adams completely taken with the baby and Mr. Adams riding circuit, no one gave me any grief when I went one evening a week and one afternoon on my day off to visit Matthew. Always the Quaker lady was there. Always she stepped forward to search me before Mr. Salem could get his hands near my being. We became friends. Quakers were not held in high esteem in Boston. It was a town of three congregational meeting houses. Bostonians had learned to live amiably with their Baptists, fresh French Protestants, Irish Presbyterians, and members of the Church of England. They only tolerated the Quakers, and barely that. I took immediately to Alice Petty Shell, seeing in her a kindred spirit. Her ancestors had been led behind a cart and whipped all through New England, she told me, for their beliefs back in Puritan times. She now belonged to a Quaker meeting on the corner of Salter's Court. Her family was in Philadelphia, she said, where Quakers were thriving. It was she who becalmed me after Matthew told me that Captain Preston was receiving unsigned letters, warning him that if he was pardoned, the people of Boston would tear down the walls of the jail. The people of Boston love to hear themselves talk, she said. And it was she and others like her who came to relieve her on her days off, who had forced the guards to provide tubs of hot water for the soldiers to wash, and who had raised such a fuss that a barber was sent into the prison to cut their hair. One day I came to find Matthew wearing clean and pressed small clothes. Alice Pattyshell did this herself, he told me. She had also brushed and aired and mended his red coat, forged backing for his and the other soldiers' boots, and requisitioned them reading matter. Thank you for what you've done for Matthew, I told her one day on my way out. Thy coming here does as much, she allowed. I smiled at her. The woman had a grace about her, a presence. She stood out like 
a gray vision, cool and unruffled by the madness that permeated Boston that summer. The bloodlust of the people, crying for the hanging of the soldiers, did not bother her. To her, there were no British or Americans, no Tories or Patriots, and the soldiers were only sad and badly treated lads a long way from home. She asked me no questions about Matthew. She did not pry. When one day, Lavinia Flucker was in the jail the same time as I. We passed as I came in as she was going out. Lavinia was as beautiful as her sister and more spoiled. Hello, Rachel Marsh, she said. I didn't expect to see you here, of all people. When she left, I was near tears. I'm in trouble now, I told Alice as she searched me for weapons. Why? She's going to tell my master I was here. He's John Adams, you know. He won't like it. I'm looking for trouble coming here. I could lose my position. Is the doing anyone harm by coming? She asked. No, but I'm the nursemaid for the Adams' children, and some say it isn't seemly I should be visiting a murderer in prison. She smiled. V is practicing charity, she said. I couldn't think of a better nursemaid for children. I thanked her politely, then went on to say that I doubted if the Adamses would see it that way. She drew herself up and looked me square in the eye. If thee loses thy position for practicing acts of charity, Rachel March, she said, come to me. I know where thee can find another. Thee is bounded. Am I right? Yes. She nodded. The Adamses are good people, but even good people can have their patience strained. This position I know of pays. Everyone in the Adams household had far too much to think of that summer to question me about visiting Matthew. For one thing, we had to move again. The landlord of Cold Lane House decided he wanted to live there himself. So while Mr. Adams was away, we moved back to Brattle Square, a different house this time, across from Dr. Samuel Cooper's meeting house. I missed the mill pond, and Mrs. Adams was worried that once the trials started, people would gather in disgruntled groups beneath their windows. Everyone was especially busy setting things to, to rights. One day in late August, I came in from the backyard with baby Charles on my shoulder to find Lavinia Flucker in the parlor. Hello, Rachel, she said. I brought some pot cheese and fresh bread and cooked fruit for supper. I know how difficult it is when you just move into a house. I stood stock still staring at her. How nice of you, Mrs. Adams beamed. Well, twas my mother who sent it. If that man's going to defend the British soldiers, she said, the least we can do is see that on the first night of their home, the supper table is laid properly. Do you two know each other? Mrs. Adams asked me. I did not answer. Lavinia did. Oh, Rachel's friends with my sister Lucy. As for me, I only see Rachel when she visits the jail. My mama sends food there to the soldiers too. Your mom is a good woman, Mrs. Adams murmured. And when she turned from the front door, she looked at me in a puzzled manner, but she said nothing. So it was done then. My secret was out. Nothing was said by Mrs. Adams, of course. We proceeded right back to work, making the house to rights. I helped her hang curtains that evening. I bathed the children. Then we all sat down in the backyard to the supper brought by Lavinia Flucker. September passed in a haze. I played with the children, read to them, and took them on picnics, for it was still hot. Evenings, I worked on my dowry. My dowry chest was filled now with pillow slips, sheets, towels, cloth for the table. Mrs. Adams had even taught me how to do cruel work. I was doing a bed cover. Evenings, I would take my linens out of the chest and handle them lovingly, then fold them and put them back. I would examine my copper bottom pots, my skillet on legs, my wooden bowls and pewter plates. I would spend hours dreaming over my beautiful things, except for hard spice. The silver coins or English pounds or Dutch Rick dollars Mr. Adams might give me. My dowry was near complete. I had no idea of the amount of hard space he might offer. The matter had been agreed upon between John Adams and Uncle Ebb. I was bound for five years. I had one year's service to complete. At the end of September, Mr. Adams returned home to prepare for the trial of Captain Preston. Fall came with its bright blue skies, its brilliant colors, its warm days and chilly nights. I loved fall the best. With its smell of wood smoke and the first cold nights under the warm blankets, the vendors hawked warm bread and hot cider on Long Wharf, where even the cry of the gulls seemed different. I always felt the hint of promise and fall, as if something were about to happen in my life. Back in Braintree, it would be harvest time. That fall, something did happen, but not what I expected. One evening, I was lying in bed. I had 
just set down a book and blown out my candle. A full moon shone in the window, making the outside landscape look like day. I must have dozed. Then I woke to the sound of voices, carrying low yet clear through the house. John Adams was speaking. But you've said nothing to her of the matter? I could not bring myself to do it. She's so good in her duties, and the children love her so. But I distinctly warned her against such a course of action. I find it difficult to believe she has flown in the face of my directives. Oh, John, she's a young girl with a head full of romantic notions. At that age, wasn't I the same? At that age, you were most studious and grave and decorous, my dear. Could you vouch for what I was thinking? You were thinking what an excellent catch I was. No doubt I was thinking how to convince you, my mother, that you weren't the mere pettifogging country lawyer she thought you were. And I have proven otherwise? You have, you have, John. But this is no time for idle talk. We must think of Rachel. I'm afraid the fault's been ours. We should never have allowed her to start walking out with Matthew in the beginning. She was our responsibility. We are to blame John, as well as she. You are right, my love. She was a young girl from Braintree, thrown into the turmoil of life in Boston. The temptations would be too much for one of sterner stuff. I lay in bed shivering. Oh, the shame of hearing them discussing me, like I was some common serving wench who hadn't worked out. Two issues involved here, Mr. Adams was saying. Issue first is that she is meeting with a young man whose life I am defending. There are many who would make much of that. Issue two is that a nurse made for our children, her actions should be above reproach. I'm sure they are, John. She's just befriending him. Abby, my darling, you may be right, but it is how her actions appear to be that can be just as damaging. No, I am going to have to take a firm stand on this. What are you going to do, John? Mrs. Adams sounded worried. In due time, I shall speak with her. We agreed to leave Boston after the trials, didn't we? Yes, John. I could not stand another winter here, and if you win the case, we will not have many friends left. I shall win it, he said. How can you be so sure? Preston's trial opens tomorrow. That case will be easy. The people want the heads of the soldiers, and if Pres Preston is cleared of giving the order of to fire, the soldiers will be more likely to be convicted. But what of the fate of the soldiers then? I shall try to prove their firing was in self-defense, and therefore justifiable homicide. It will be difficult, but I can do it. Silence for a moment or two. And what of Rachel? I shall not reproach her or make her feel in any way that she has failed. No doubt the child does not know the wrong she has done. Don't forget, Abby, she didn't have the benefit of your upbringing with a kind father, who also happened to be the richest clergyman in the province, and a mother who was a Quincy. No, I shall not lay blame. I shall tell her we are going back to Braintree, and that I am quite sure she won't want to be going with us. What's there for her? I shall tell her we will pay for her dowry money and find her another position. Mrs. Adams said something, then murmured soft and low. I could not hear it. No doubt it was because I was sobbing quietly into my pillow. Next morning, I did not want to go downstairs. My eyes were puffy from crying, but everyone was so occupied with the Preston case, little mind was paid to me. And Abigail Adams was just as amiable as always. I waited all day, sure that when Mr. Adams came home from court that night, he would summon me, but he did not. He all but ignored me. Then the next morning early, the British fleet and the harbor started firing its guns. Rachel, Rachel, Johnny came racing into the room. Mama says you may take us to the harbor today to see the celebration. What celebration? It's King George's the third's birthday, Nabby reported. No, children, it's the anniversary of his accession to the throne, their mother said. The guns will boom all day, Johnny answered. Will you take me, will you? I knelt down and he hugged me. Aren't you afraid of the guns? No, Rachel, he said solemnly. I'm not afraid, not if you take me. Over his head as he hugged me, I saw Mrs. Adams watching us. What was she thinking? I took the children to the harbor that morning and we stayed all day for the festivities. The weather was warm and bright. I bought them sweets to eat and we enjoyed ourselves together. I had a feeling, going home, that it'd be one of the last good days I would have with them. I become attached to the children and they to me. Little Nabby asked endless questions clung to my skirts and was full of energy. Little Johnny's hand clasped mine. My Rachel, he called me, my friend, and his chubby arms would hug me tightly. As I brought them home that day, I was full of guilt and sorrow for what I had done. I had allowed myself to be pulled into the politics and the hatreds and the sordidness of Boston. 
I had forgotten my real purpose for coming here, my vow to myself. I had betrayed the people who had been good to me, and now I would lose the place I had worked so hard to get. Now, one day soon, I would be asked to leave. I would have to say goodbye to these dear children and never see them again. I went home and cried in my room. I waited for Mr. Adams to summon me. Every night when I went to sleep, I wondered why he had let another day go by without delivering his ultimatum. Every morning when I woke, I went downstairs fully expecting it. But it did not happen. The days passed as before. No one said anything unpleasant to me. I went to visit Matthew twice a week, as always. No one made any attempt to stop me. I saw Jane once, on the street, but she was occupied with attending the trial. Henry Knox was testifying, she said. I did not go to see Henry or Lucy. Except for the visits to Matthew, I stayed home. I needed to collect my thoughts, to husband my strength. The rhythms of the household had always done that for me, and now I found comfort in their sameness. I desperately wanted sameness and order. I began to fancy, as October deepened and the fires were lightened each day in the hearth, that perhaps Mr. Adams had had a change of heart. But no, he was just too pre preoccupied with Captain Preston's trial. I went on for a week, and it was all anybody in Boston talked about or cared about. John Adams came home every night, grim-faced and edgy. Mrs. Adams told me to keep the children out of his way, and I did so, gladly. I went to visit Matthew on the day that the jury was deciding Captain Preston's fate. Matthew was glum. Word has gotten back to us, he said, that Preston testified that he gave us no orders to fire, and we must take the consequences. Oh, Matthew, I commiserated. Just at that moment, the inner door of the jail clanged open, and Lavinia Flucker burst in. Oh, have you heard? Oh, everyone, listen. The jury has reported its verdict. Not guilty. Matthew and the others groaned. Preston has thrown us to the wolves, he said. Now we are murderers because we fired without orders. On the way out, I found Lavinia Flucker waiting for me. She flashed a smile. Just on the premise that you may be looking for a new position one of these days, she said, you should know that my parents are desperately seeking a new girl. And why should I be seeking a new position? No reason, except that everything is changing in Boston. Oh, a person can just feel it, walking the streets, pressed and not guilty. You know, Rachel Marsh, this business is not over yet between the Crown and the people. The British will be back. And when they come back, you do well to be employed in a good Tory household. And with that, she tossed her head and walked into the street. It was the perfect time for Mr. Adams to call me to his office because I was so upset over what Matthew had said that afternoon that I did not care about anything. Whatever happened to me, it couldn't be any worse than what would happen to Matthew. Mr. Adams summoned me after supper that very evening. The fire in the hearth burned brightly. From upstairs, I can hear little Johnny's feet pattering down the hall as his mama readied him for bed. It was my job to put him to bed, and the denial of that duty hurt me sorely. Rachel, he smiled, come in and sit down. So, he was going to be nice. Oh, that would make it twice as difficult to bear. I sat woodenly in one of the chairs. Well, Rachel, you must have heard the verdict. Captain Preston was cleared this day. Yes, sir, you've done yourself proud. It isn't over yet, of course. The most difficult part is to come. The burden is on the defense now to prove the soldiers' acts were justifiable homicide. What does that mean, sir? It means they won't hang, Rachel, if I have my way. I felt flooded with relief. He was a good man. Oh, I hope you can do it, sir, I said. I shall do my best, Rachel, but right now my concern is you. My wife and I are greatly concerned about you. After the trials, you see, we are going to move back to Braintree. It's only 10 miles from Boston. I shall write in every day to do business but my wife and I yearn for the simpler life back there. I ran my tongue along my lips and waited. My temple was throbbing. We do not wish you to pine away in the backwoods of this province, however. So, after much consideration, we have decided to release you from our agreement. I shall speak to your uncle and give you your dowry money and find a good paying position for you here in Boston. You've become accustomed to the town, you have friends here now, and you will certainly find no husband back in Braintree. What say you, Rachel? What say I? I wanted to say so many things. I yearned to say them, that I did not want to leave their service, that I'd been happier with them than I'd been my whole life, that I'd felt as if I'd have a home here, and I loved the children so, and who would fix Nabby's hair every morning and be there for Johnny when he came bursting into my room, who would comfort him at night when he woke with nightmares, and what would he think when he called for me and I did not come? I said none of this, however. What was done was done. I had not lived up to my part of the agreement by being the genteel nursemaid to their children. I had run with the ramble in the streets. 
I had not honored the position they gave me. I had consorted with one of the British soldiers, possibly compromising Mr. Adams. And if not that, then certainly bringing gossip to touch their house. But more than all of that, John Adams did not even wish to speak of such matters to me. He wished to conduct this interview in an as amiable a manner as possible. He wanted to spare me hurt, and he wanted no unpleasantness to exit between us. I was not accustomed to such gentility. Uncle Eb and I had screamed at each other. My mother and Uncle Eb had fought like cat and dog. And so it was that that evening I learned my most valuable lesson since coming to Boston. The Adamses and their kind were different from me and my kind. It had to do with breeding and family. I had heard Mr. Adams say once that Abigail's great-great-grandsire had been a founder of the province. Surely no amount of book reading on my part could make up for such a family background. So all I did was sit there and nod my head and say, yes, sir. He was so relieved, poor man. He positively beamed. Then he went on to speak of money, hard spice money, silver, and how the rest of my dowry would be completed. I nodded, but was not listening. What I was doing was trying to figure out how I was going to get out of that room without bursting into tears and disgracing myself.